Happy New Year. It's Jeremy Vine here in the studio. Thank you so much for downloading our first What Makes Us Human podcast of 2019. It was Professor Alice Roberts today answering the question. And it's hard to imagine anyone better qualified to do so because as a child, she was given a book, a pop-up book. Imagine this with the human body in. She became fascinated. Even the skull pops out of the book. And she just decided, I want to do anatomy. That's what she focused on. So can she somehow unpick the human body and tell us what makes us human? That's what we wanted to find out. And you wait, you're going to really enjoy this one. BBC Radio 2 asks the question, what makes us human? So what makes us human? My next guest is an anatomist and anthropologist, writer and broadcaster as well. If anyone is an expert on what makes us human, surely it is her. Just listen to the titles of some of the books and TV shows and radio programs that she's done. The Origins of Us, Don't Die Young, Evolution, The Human Story, Human Anatomy, The Complete Human Body. The list goes on. Her most recent challenge has seen her become president of Humanists UK. Now, they are a charity existing in their own words to bring together non-religious people who seek to live ethical and fulfilling lives on the basis of reason and humanity. So Professor Alice Roberts is here to tell us what she thinks makes us human. BBC Radio 2 asks the question, what makes us human? We've just marked the end of one year and the start of another. Like the Roman god Janus, the doorkeeper, we've all been looking back over the last 12 months and then forwards, wondering what the next year will bring. We're acutely aware of the passing of time, not just on a daily basis, but with reference to the deep past and the distant future, even beyond the span of our own lives. The way we appreciate time seems intrinsically linked to our own experience. I remember being a small kid at primary school and thinking that the 11-year-olds were impossibly old and unachievably mature, and that teenagers, well, they were like beings from another planet. As an 18-year-old, 30 seemed old and generally past it. And then at 30, I could imagine being 40, 50, 60, 70. And you start to grasp the reality of your own end, of course. Now I'm in my mid-40s, I think I've come to terms with my own mortality. But at the same time, the concept of not being is impossible to properly apprehend. Now, there are many things which we consider to be uniquely human, which turn out actually not to be unique at all. We differ from other animals by degree. Some chimpanzees use thick sticks to make holes in a termite nest and then break a thinner stick down to the right length to fish termites out through those holes. Others use stones to crack nuts. Our technology seems like a world away from that, but it did evolve from such humble beginnings. And yet, our understanding of time, I think, is something which is completely distinct. Humans uniquely know that they've been born and that they will end, they will die. And I suspect that all of religion is, at its foundations, concerned with providing us with some solace in the face of this unimaginable but unavoidable fact. We know that there are beginnings and endings then, and so we're fascinating, fascinated with what comes before the beginning and after the end, Every culture we know of has its own origin myth. The question of origins, who we are, where we come from, not just as individuals, but as humans, seems to be a very ancient one. For thousands of years, questions like those have been explored through philosophy and religion, but now the answers seem to lie firmly within the grasp of a rational scientific approach to the world and our place in it. The clues come from different branches of science. Archaeology turns up material culture from the past, allowing us to see what our ancestors made and to know something of their ways of thinking. We also find physical fossilised remains of our ancestors' bones. We can interpret brain size from ancient skulls and work out how these ancient people walked and ran and sometimes even see how they must have cared for those suffering diseases or injury. But there are also clues to our origins, hidden in living bodies, traces of evolution that we find by studying the fine structure of the human body or its embryonic development. And then, of course, now there are genomes too, and that's a huge archive of data, which we're now mining faster than ever and uncovering many more answers and surprises. And so looking forward to this new year, I know we'll keep finding more. We'll keep looking back at what we've already found, reinterpreting that, but we'll find more answers in the ground, in our bodies, in our genes. And that's what keeps me fascinated by this particular area of science. And then personally, knowing that I'm only here on this planet for a short time and then I will be gone, that keeps me searching for more ways to make this one life meaningful.
Thank you very much indeed, Alice Roberts. And you can listen again to Alice's essay by downloading the podcast, What Makes Us Human, it's called. Just head to the BBC Sounds app or whatever your podcast provider website is. And Alice's chosen track today is This Is Me from the brilliant film The Greatest Showman, sung by Kiara Settle. This is brave, this is bruised, this is who I'm meant to be, this is me. <laughs> Kiara Settle and the cast of The Greatest Showman, This Is Me. I can see you love that. Oh, this was the song we chose to end the Christmas lectures this year. So we had the Be Positive Choir, the NHS Choir, in the Faraday Lecture Theatre in the Royal Institution and a whole lecture theatre full of kids and also children from around the country um, playing in in clips. Um, and it was all about embracing difference and diversity. And, yeah, that was the big, big message at the end of the Christmas lectures. And, I mean, I'm always wondering how to describe you because I could say, I could almost say archaeologist, I could certainly say anthropologist, Apologist, I in the end went with anatomist. In other words, you your fascination is with how we're built. Is that correct? I think so. I mean, I I, I think if you cut me through the middle, a bit like a stick of Brighton Rock, it says anatomist right. through me. It, so sort of, it runs right very word. deep. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and and where does that come from? Did somebody give you a book at some point, or did you see a, one of those skeletons that hang, hung in a lab, or what? Oh, we're very good at um, making up these post hoc narratives, aren't we? Um, I I can. I can pinpoint a time, which was uh, when I was seven and I was given a book by Jonathan Miller and David Pelham. It was a pop-up book of human anatomy and I've still got it and it grabbed me. Really? Uh, yeah. Because hey, we're going back, you know, three decades there. It probably wasn't very technically on it, was it, that pop-up uh, no, it was, book? It was beautiful. Um, really? Yeah, it was really good. Um, there was a there was a fantastic pop-out skull, which was bones on one side and then had all the muscles of the face, and they're very accurate. You know, I've gone back and checked it, and they're very, very accurate. And, so, it, yeah, it just it really did grab me, that, that kind of fascination with what's on the inside of us under the skin. Because we very rarely think about that, do we? Where we don't, I mean, you don't think about how your knee works until in your 40s you suddenly have a knee problem. And then you, and and I then think you're about it all the time. Oh, do you? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's unusual, I think. But is it? Did, did you become a, a sort of skeleton bore when you were a, a teenager? You're saying, look, hang on, everyone, I want to talk about the fibula. Oh yeah, definitely. And um, you know, I, I then um, I suppose I suppose I then decided to go into medicine, and I and I had my heart set on surgery, and uh, you know, and that that was what I was going to do. And then I got kind of sidetracked from that into academia, and then the anatomy kind of it had its claws in me. It got me back. And the skull, particularly, because you mentioned the pop-up book. I know you've done a lot of studies on the skull and how it develops. Yeah, yeah. So I looked at the development of the skull embryologically um, as part of my undergraduate research. And then, um, yeah, I've, I think the skull is one of the most interesting bits of the body because it's got to do so many different things. It's got to handle sense organs. Meaning what in the in the womb, in and, the womb. And, and in the very early days and weeks in the womb, because by eight weeks in, you're you're pretty much fully formed as a bit. You're still tiny. Um, but you've got a beating heart, you've got fingers and toes, all of that sort of thing. So the really interesting stuff happens uh, in the first few weeks of development. So, yeah, I've, I've, and I've lectured about this endlessly and then thought, oh, these are great stories, I need to write a book about it. So I wrote a book called The Incredible Unlikeliness of Being, which is all about embryology and evolution and how the two are intertwined. Because everyone always focuses on the last three, four months of pregnancy, but for you it's the first couple of months. It's almost before yeah. you know you're pregnant, is yeah, that right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's, What's um, going on? So one cell creates all of us, is that right? I, know, I mean, this is the amazing thing, is that, is that um, you know, by eight weeks you've got something which looks like a tiny baby. Uh, so, you know, it has, as I said, it has its fingers and toes. It has a lot of its organ systems in place. And it's the um, size of a thumb, is it? Or It's really tiny. Thumbnail, yeah, maybe. Yeah, yeah, maybe one and a half centimetres. Um, so, so that's come from a single cell. So that journey from being a single cell to a ball of cells and then um, all of the complicated origami that then goes on after that and the way that cells... Uh, are sort of told what they're going to become because they have to kind of grow up and become uh, cells of a particular type. You know, they start off being pluripotent. They could turn into anything, but they have to grow up and become cartilage cells and then bone cells or muscle cells. And then, yeah, and they have to know where they are in the body as well. It's abs it's utterly fascinating. But why, do, I mean, it is, like we, it's just amazing because so many questions flow from that. I mean, why doesn't some at some point someone get born with 
a toe sticking out of their skull, for example, where the cells have got the wrong information. Yeah, well, obviously, occasionally you do get, um, you know, horrendous congenital malformations and a lot of them are not compatible with life. Um, But the fact that it does happen uh, very well so many times, you know, we're all we're all kind of living evidence of that. Yeah, it's it's amazing because it's so complicated. Mm. And that cell has all the information that creates Alice and Jeremy, or so we're told. And at this point, we get that split between the humanists and you've I mentioned your role with humanism, and people who I guess you should widely have a faith, let's, let's say, or religion, who think it's not possible. We're not going to find all the answers by looking into that thing with ever more powerful microscopes. The answer will be above us in some kind of God. You don't buy that. I don't. Um, I'm. I suppose I'm fiercely rational about my approach to the world. I was brought up. Um, religious. So I was brought up going to church every Sunday. I got confirmed as an Anglican. And then I think age 15 went, there are too many holes in this for me. What were the biggest holes in it? Um, Believing in things that you couldn't see any evidence for. Um, was the, was the biggest one, right? So there's a and God, also the we, need for yeah. that. So the need, you know, the I don't see there's no there's no need in any of my scientific inquiry uh, to invoke anything supernatural. It all seems it all seems perfectly natural and beautiful and wonderful. And I have a strong sense of spirituality, which I think comes from that feeling of being part of nature. Um, but I don't I don't feel the need for there to be anything supernatural that we can't see, can't hear. And we just maybe some, somehow feel it's there. So why do people, so many people believe in something supernatural? Let's say God. Broadly, God. If uh, science is gradually crowding out God, how come so many people believe there is one? I don't know whether it's science that's crowding, crowding out God. I mean, I think that um, it's interesting when you look at what religious people believe um, in Britain, sort of over from the 19th century into the 20th century. In the 19th century... Um, a lot of Christians in Britain believed in the actual uh, physical reality of hell and that continued into the 20th century and that's kind of gone away now for most people. Um, so, you know, sort of what, what people actually believe in, I think, has, has changed a lot. Um, but I think that we're, you know, we're able to explain where we come from and I, I, that's, I was talking about that in the essay with these the sort of origin myths. We're able to explain where humans have come from, which seems to be an enduring question. And, you know, religion has has tried to provide answers to that, sometimes in quite a scientific way. I mean, I think if you look at what it says in Genesis, you go, well, given what they had to deal with at the time, you know, given the amount of evidence they had, it's a pretty reasonable hypothesis. But of course, what we do then with science is, is test those hypotheses, hypotheses. And we've come quite a long way since then. And we know about the Big Bang and we know about the origins of the universe. And we can see the origin of life on Earth and the evolution of the diversity that we see today. So... I mean, from my perspective, as a as a as a humanist, um, and atheism is part of that for me. There's no need for God, but it doesn't mean that God couldn't be there. I can't ever disprove a God, right? So because you I could be hiding people, really well. Yeah, but I think, and I think for for people, there's there shouldn't be any conflict between accepting things like the fact of evolution, which is so evident from all the fossil record and the evidence in our own bodies, and all of that. Um, and and being religious, and you know, there are a lot of there are a lot of biologists and paleontologists who are religious. So I don't see any. I, I re, I'm a real fan of Stephen Jay Gould's um, non-overlapping magisteria. That there are different things, um, and there are different ways of looking at the world, and there doesn't need to be a clash between science and religion. No, but it's interesting in your essay, you you clearly point out, which I hadn't really thought of, that we we are a species who need explanations. So yeah. when, when maybe we create God out of that or, we, you know, we find them in science or whatever. Now, w- when you were talking about evolution, I, I was thinking about the human body and wondering if we are, how far we, you think we've evolved? Because I have we got to the point where we are now Ferraris or are we still mini metros? Have we got a long, <laughs> is there a long way to go still? Um well, yeah, there's as long as we're there as long as uh, as long as we're around. But what else? Um, what, how would you evolve the body differently if you were if you were souping up the human body now? Well, you know, I did this for I did this I for did. BBC Four last year, and we kind of souped it up in a number of ways. But um, it involves a lot of subjective decisions about what you want it to do. So, which, got, for example, I was going to say, I know you pointed out something I've always wondered, which is why on earth you can't talk with your mouth full. I mean, why do you eat <laughs> eat and speak with the same opening? Seems really strange. Oh, I sat down with my very good friend, ENT surgeon Martin Birchall, to try and work out how we could separate the airway and the digestive tract and therefore avoid this problem of not being able to 
talk with your mouth full and choking, which, you know, is an issue. Um, and we got as far as, as as redesigning it and kind of replumbing the tubes and everything. And then and then Martin said, oh, but, you know, there is um, half a litre of phlegm, which is produced um, every day, which obviously comes out of your lungs and up to your mouth, um, up to your throat. Um, and what do you do with that? if you're not then able to just swallow it, which is what happens. You know, we don't know that there's this half a litre yeah. of phlegm which is coming up every day and that's how our, our lungs clean themselves. So that was a bit of an issue. And you, ca- I mean, this is the thing, you, keep, you, you try to redesign something and then you find you're actually creating another problem for yourself. So, I mean, the fact that we're here and the fact that, you know, we evolved, um, the earliest evidence of modern humans goes back about 300,000 years ago and we evolved, we evolved from apes who were around 10 million years ago and, you know, and then earlier primates. And, you know, we've, we've done pretty well to be here and evolution doesn't produce perfection evolution just produces things which are good enough but you know we're, we're doing pretty well there's billions of us well except that we seem to be creaking under the weight of the fact that we were evolved to find food and now we can find it really easily yeah and therefore we're getting fatter and fatter yeah but we're clever as well so we need to be able to sort you know we we'll need sort to sort out, ourselves we? out yeah okay <laughs> we to... so we'll be a world where we can eat as much as we want and not get fat at some point no, I don't think we we need to know that we we can't eat as much as we want. We have to be we have to be careful about that. But you know we are we are clever sentient sentient animals. So I think that you know we should be able to overcome these things. You, you um, know, it does. I mean the the link between um, uh, obesity and poverty in this country is is evident. And, you know, we need to make sure that as a society we're, we're looking after people better. Employers need to look after their employees better. There's all sorts of societal things which aren't just about individual choice. Um, as we're talking about what makes us human, you did say we do uniquely understand that we'll all die. And I then thought that's a very interesting one. I don't think we've had that before. Do animals understand that they will die one day? Probably it's, not. Uh, it's impossible to know for sure, isn't it? I suspect they don't. I suspect yeah. that individual animals don't know. We do know that some animals mourn. So we know that chimpanzees mourn and we know that and we know that elephants mourn. But whether they actually understand what that means for them as individuals, that they know that they at some point will die, uh uh, it's impossible to test. So it's, and, again, it's one of those things which is beyond the bounds of science to actually test it. But and you I mentioned you're, they don't. you mentioned you're in your mid forties, and I was just thinking that that is 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 that the moment where maybe we lose parents or at this stage in life or whatever, but we start to realise there's going to be a world one day without us in it, mm. and it might mm. not be till about this moment in life that we realise how real that thought is. Is yeah. that right? Yeah, I think so. I mean, it's, I've I've found it really interesting looking at how my own perception of time has been framed by my own lifespan, and my ability now to look back and think about, for instance, the Second World War, and my grandfather who drove a, a tank onto Sword Beach at D Day, and I remember him talking to me about that when I was a kid, and it wow. seemed like an impossibly long time ago, whereas now I think back to that, and it and it seems reachable. And I think Gosh. it's because I'm now measuring time in 45 year segments because I've got an appreciation of what 45 years That's actually so means. That's so interesting. Yeah, um, that we do seem to be now maybe uh, having a generation of people, uh, or maybe this is just describes all 20 somethings, where it, it's. I don't want to be rude about millennials, but um, you're much more centred around yourself. But maybe it's digital does that to a person. I don't know. Less of a sense that what matters three hundred, what what happened three hundred, four hundred years ago matters. So I'll give you an example. I present a quiz show called Eggheads. Younger teams are much more likely to say, "I can't tell you the answer because it's before my time." It's a facet of being young that what happened before your time didn't happen. Yeah, yeah. Do you grow into an understanding that it did happen and it does matter? I think you grow into. Uh an understanding which is which is more intuitive, um, but I think that um, history is incredibly important, and I think that you know a, a history which also tells us something about geopolitics is is really important to understand where we are now and why we're here. And we have also... a desire as, as humans to locate ourselves, do we? Do you think in history? Because if you're in the ant world, the ant, I'm. This is silly, but ants don't go around talking about the ant version of Henry VIII who lived. They don't do that. We've got to assume. Whereas we obsess with the Tudors and this and that. Yeah, it's amazing yeah. how much we talk about it. Yeah, and I think that we're constantly using it as a kind of mirror for now. 
So we're kind of going right. I say, so when you look at Henry VIII and the and the kind of split with with Catholicism and this, which was a kind of Brexit, um, you know, what does that what does that tell us about Britain and the relationship with continental Europe and systems of power in continental Europe? I think it's absolutely fascinating to do that. Um, so it does uh, it does give us a mirror. It does give us a, a a contrast and a comparison. But I'm also I think that. I think there's something else about humans, which is which is a rootedness in the landscape, and that's something that I feel really acutely. I love um, finding traces archaeologically of ancestors in the landscape and feeling connected uh, with those landscapes, uh, and that's something I've enjoyed um, exploring in my various television series. But it's something I feel really, really attached to at home as well. I feel really kind of connected with the with the landscape of Southwest England um, and the, all the people all the people who were there in the past and who were buried under those Bronze Age barrows and we don't know their names but somehow having those ancestors there is really important. That's good because it gives me a chance to mention that you're on tour soon with something called Digging into Britain's Past so you're going to at least a dozen places to talk about exactly that, yeah. right? Yeah, starting okay. with London, Oxford, Litchfield next week uh, and yeah, looking looking back over all of the sites that I've visited over the years, so so a real kind of romp through British history and archaeology, and little bits from digging for Britain and um, my Channel Four series, um, Britain's Most Historic Towns, and we're back with the second series later this spring. Thank you so much for talking about what makes us human, Professor Alice Roberts. Listen to more podcasts from Radio Two by downloading the BBC Sounds app.